Good morning, everyone. So you're all familiar faces to each other, but not to me. How many of you remember I was here at one time? You remember? That was a long time ago. Yeah, like 15 years ago. Yeah, it was just after your pastor had left, shortly after. And I was here with Pastor Ed Poppy. And so we shared together. And I came back now this time for the first time in many years. And the place looks twice as big as it did then. <laughs> Different perceptions, I guess. So it's good to be with you today and a special welcome to the visitors or guests that are here as well. And we hope and pray that uh, you are going to be blessed and enriched and nurtured in this worship hour. We begin our worship with the opening hymn then, I believe, isn't it? Number 765, is it? And let us please stand. in the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. God of all mercy and consolation, come to the help of your people, turning us from our sin to live for you alone. Give us the power of your Holy Spirit that we may confess our sin, receive your forgiveness, and grow into the fullness of Jesus Christ, our Savior and Lord. Amen. Let us now confess our sin in the presence of God and of one another. Most merciful God, we confess that we are captive to sin, we cannot free ourselves, we have sinned against you in thought, word, and deed, and by what we have left undone, we have not loved you with our whole heart, we have not loved our neighbors as ourselves, for the sake of your Son, Jesus Christ, have mercy on us. Give us, renew us, and lead us, so that we may delight in your will, and walk in your ways, to the glory of your holy name. Amen. 
In the mercy of Almighty God, Jesus Christ was given to die for us, and for his sake God forgives us all our sins. As a called and ordained minister of the Church of Christ and by his authority, I therefore declare to you the entire forgiveness of all your sins, in the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. The grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God, and the communion of the Holy Spirit be with you all. is the feast of victory for our God. Alleluia. Christ the Lamb who was slain, blood set us free, people of God, power and rest. be with you. Let us pray. Sovereign God, you have created us to live in loving community with one another. Form us for life that is faithful and steadfast. Teach us to trust like little children, that we may reflect the image of your Son, Jesus Christ, our Savior and Lord. Amen. Be seated.
Our first reading comes from Genesis chapter 2, <clears throat> beginning at the 18th verse. The Lord God said, It is not good that the man should be alone. I will make him a helper as his partner. So out of the ground the Lord formed every animal of the field and every bird of the air and brought them to the man to see what he would call them. And whatever the man called every living creature, that was its name. The man gave names to all the cattle, to the birds of the air, to every animal of the field. But for the man there was not found a helper as his partner. So the Lord God caused a deep sleep to fall upon the man, and he slept. And then he took one of his ribs and closed up its place with flesh. And the rib that the Lord God had taken from the man, he made into a woman and brought her to the man. Then the man said, this at last is bone of my bones and flesh of my flesh. This one shall be called woman, for out of man this one was taken. Therefore a man leaves his father and his mother and clings to his wife, and they become one flesh. The word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Let us read the psalm responsively. It's Psalm 8. O oh Lord, our Lord, how majestic is your name in all the earth. You whose glory is chanted above the heavens, <coughs> out of the mouths of infants and children, and has set up a fortress against your enemies to silence the foes and the avenger. When I considered your heavens, the work of your fingers, the moon and the stars, you have set in their courses. You should be mindful of them, human beings, that you should care for them. Yet you have made them little less than divine. With glory and honor you crown them. Made them rule over the works of your hands. You have put all things under their feet. All flocks and cattle, even the wild beasts of the field. The birds of the air, the fish of the sea, whatever passes along the paths of the sea. O Lord, our Lord, how majestic is your name in all the earth. You have made human beings little less than divine. With glory and honor you crown them. The second reading is taken as a reading from Hebrews, verse 1, or chapter 1. Verse 1 is where it begins. Long ago, God spoke to our ancestors in many and various ways by the prophets. But in those days, or in the, he has spoken to us by a son, whom he appointed heir of all things, through whom he also created the world. He is the reflection of God's glory and the exact imprint of God's very being. He stains all things by his powerful word. And when he had made purification for sins, he sat down at the right hand of the majesty on high. Having become as much superior to angels as the name he has inherited is more excellent than theirs. Now, God did not subject the coming world about which we are talk, speaking to angels but someone has testified somewhere. What are human beings <clears throat> that you are mindful of them, or mortals that you care for them? You have made them for a little while lower than the angels. You have crowned them with glory and honor, subjecting all things under their feet. Now in subjecting all things to them, God left nothing outside their control. As it is, we do not yet see everything in subjection to them. But we do see Jesus, who for a little while 
was made lower than the angels, but now is crowned with glory and honor because of the suffering and death, so that by the grace of God, he might taste death for everyone. It was fitting that God, for whom and through whom all things exist, in bringing many children to glory, should make a pioneer of their salvation, perfect through suffering. For the one who sanctifies and those who are sanctified all have one Father. For this reason, Jesus is not ashamed to call them brothers and sisters, saying, I will proclaim your name to my brothers and sisters. In the midst of the congregation, I will praise you. The word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Gospels according to St. Mark, the 10th chapter. Some Pharisees came and to test Jesus. They asked him, is it lawful for a man to divorce his wife? He answered them, what did Moses command you? They said, Moses allowed a man to write a certificate of dismissal and to divorce her. But Jesus said to them, because of your hardness of heart, he wrote his commandment for you. But from the beginning of creation, God made them male and female. For this reason a man shall leave his father and mother and be joined to his wife, and the two shall become one flesh. So they are no longer two but one flesh. Therefore what God has joined together let no one separate. Then in the house the disciples asked him again about this matter, and Jesus said to them, Whoever divorces his wife and marries another commits adultery against her. And if she divorces her husband and marries another, she commits adultery. People were bringing little children to Jesus in order that he might touch them. And the disciples spoke sternly to them. But when Jesus saw this, he was indignant and said to them, Let the little children come to me. Do not stop them. For it is to such as these that the kingdom of God belongs. Truly I tell you, whoever does not receive the kingdom of God as a little child will never enter it. And he took them up in his arms, laid his hands on them, and blessed them. The Gospel of the Lord. Praise to you, Lord Christ. Let me see The bulletin did have my name listed, but I should probably have just said to you once again, I'm Al Wall, or Alan Wall, as my mother called me. And um, I've been retired since 2001, and um, I have been helping out in congregations, supplying when, get, when I get a call, and somebody from your parish here called me and said you will be remembered by some of the people there, and hope you enjoy your time when you come over to Janesville, and I certainly do. We live in Madison, and we've been there all these years since we left our last parish, which is over in Racine County in the Greater Milwaukee Synod. And, um, and we've enjoyed being a part of, continue to be part of the church. As a retired pastor, I, I haven't withdrawn, so to speak, as some have, but have been involved in, 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 in uh, trying to experience the church in as many ways as we still can. It was the summertime, and it was chaotic time for us as we moved from one house to another to begin our retirement at Madison. We moved to the Arbor Hills neighborhood. And uh, while we were unpacking and it was chaotic in the house, we had a visitor come to the door. The visitor was a representative from the Senate office and said, Al, we'd like you to consider going to St. John's in Janesville and helping out in the parish there during the time when their pastor, since the pastors have left. So we were glad to be asked and glad to be able to come and serve and partner up with you and your ministry here for those few months. 
As I mentioned, we were associated with Pastor Ed Poppy at the time, the late pastor. And we served here for several months, maybe until March or April of 2002. I can't remember those details as much. As you know, we, uh, we had then our own pastor and our own church that we joined in Madison. It was a pastor by the name of Jeff Weil who was your former pastor, and he served us in that church for these 14 years that we've been there. And he retired this past December and is enjoying his retirement uh, very much as I understand. I see him on occasion. You'll have to pardon me if I want to share a few memories. I had already this observation that the place looked different to me this time coming in here, but that I guess is part of life. But I want to just share uh, just a few little memories before I dive into this uh, passage of the gospel today. First of all, I remember the farewell. The farewell was, was really kind of cute because um, somebody came up to the lectern area here when I had that last Sunday, which was, you know, just something very simple. And some Somebody gave me a little four-wheeled wagon that is made here somewhere in Janesville, I believe. And then on top of that, there was a six-pack of Sprecher root beer. And that, was, that, was, that was really neat, and it was a lot of fun. I remember one of the services, and I don't know why it sticks in my mind, except that it uh, spoke to my heart, and that was when we had Good Friday service here that year, or that spring. And uh, there was a quartet, and the quartet sang the hymn, When I Survey the Wondrous Cross. And that's just really one of my favorite hymns during the Lenten season. And uh, that hymn, as it was sung, was done so beautifully by that, those four some people that it brought tears to my eyes, and I've not forgotten that. And then finally, the remembrance of what happened in the fall of that year. That was one of the most horrific moments in our American history when the 9-11 occurred in New York City. And I remember then, I don't know what day of the week that occurred on. I don't know it was September 11th. And um, we were then going to lead our worship here at your church. And I remember how difficult that really was. And for some reason, that's kind of stuck in my mind and my heart, that the tragedy was so beyond words, it felt like. It also felt like we were helpless. What do we say to our people? What do we say that can bring any sense that this, again, there still can be hope and there still can be meaning for our lives? So our words didn't seem to resonate like I thought we should have, they should have. And I've often felt that we could have done so much better. But I really think that you folks in the parish were just as stunned as we pastors. And you were just as, as probably hardly knew what to say, just as we hardly do how to express ourselves in those very difficult moments. So, those are some memories from our life here at that time. So as a retired pastor, occasionally I go and visit some other churches, but I do supply preach, and whenever I do, I of course have the experience of sharing a good a message. But uh, there are ways that, things that I listen to nowadays that I perhaps didn't think about years ago. And I listen to words that resonate with me. I listen to words that sound authentic to me. I listen to words in the service that will help carry me during the coming week. I listen to words that are assurance, words of assurance that I'm part of God's holy family. I remember a lady once told me the words that I want to hear at Sunday morning, I want you to tell me that I'm a sinner. And I want you to tell me that God has forgiven me. See, that's all I need. That's what I want to hear. Well, you know how to measure, or I suppose, in some way, your own personal needs and spiritual life. You can perhaps feel sometimes an emptiness of your own heart as you come to worship. You may need and recognize that you also have a hunger in your soul for that which is transcendent. And you may also need to hear the word that says, I'm sleeping on the switch here. I've got to get moving in my life. And so maybe you want to be challenged in a way that you haven't been challenged before. Maybe you want to 
ask God to help you live more faithfully. Perhaps you want to ask God to help you do the mission that Christ calls us to do in the world. The Gospel reading today, grace and peace to you. The Gospel reading today is really two separate texts tied together. One is the question of divorce, the other is the blessing of the children. <clears throat> the question of divorce is often listed as one of the hard sayings of Jesus. As one commentator wrote, it perhaps should be labeled as painful or distressing as you hear it. You may feel as if you are being assaulted. And you may do as others feel cringe, just feel as you want to cringe at the words that were coming from Jesus' lips. So this is real. It's real forceful words today. And I believe that as the Church of Jesus Christ, we need to listen to these words and listen to the meaning that they offer to us. Not evade them or skirt around them, even though they certainly are complicated. Marriage has been an issue, of course, in our land now for many weeks and really several years. The, the uh, city county clerk in Kentucky has gotten headlines in the paper for refusing to offer marriage licenses, as you well know, uh, to the gay community. And uh, there are a lot, of, a lot of factors involved with the question of marriage these days. Hardly a family has gone on in this society without having a divorce in some place, including our own with our eldest daughter, Julie. So people have gone through divorce and they've experienced painful moments, for sure. And uh, there's no reason in the world for us as a church to skirt around or to avoid talking about this issue of marriage and divorce. We need to be sensitive as a church to these issues. Now, if we go to the heart of the matter, we hear Jesus' answer to the test question that the Pharisees throw at Jesus. Is it lawful for a man to divorce his wife? And the reading actually changes a little bit because in another passage it says, is it lawful for a man to divorce his wife for any cause? In other words, what are the lawful grounds for divorce? It's a Another test case for Jesus to trap him, as the Pharisees often tried to do. Or is there any case that would call for marriage to, uh, marriage to be separated or divorced for any cause, like burned toast, for example, in the morning? Or, the, or adultery in that case, in another case. So the question was meant to trap Jesus, as we said. So rather than dealing with a question on a legal basis, Jesus quotes a creation story from Genesis about God's purpose for marriage. From the beginning, God made them male and female. A man shall leave his father and mother and be joined to his wife. The two shall become one flesh. They are no longer two, but one. What God has joined together, let no one separate. How many of you had these verses read on your wedding days, your wedding service, on your marriage day? We, many of us have. Many of us did. So by linking marriage to the creation story in trying to answer the Pharisees' question, Jesus is elevating marriage as something more than a legal obligation. He is saying this is what God has intended for the human life to be about. God chooses to bless our marriages and delights when they flourish. And whenever a marriage ends in divorce or separation, it must grieve the heart of God because of the damage done to God's children. Relationships are intended to be given by God. And when they fall apart, they bring grief, and a sense of loss and much heartache. A separation of a relationship breaks the bond of trust that once existed for a couple. So divorce is not an easy topic for us in the church. It was a disputed and complicated matter in the early church and in the days of Jesus, the first century. In the Jewish custom, for example, the husband had the power to decide on a divorce. But in our text, Mark includes the Roman custom that not only could a man divorce his wife, but a woman or a wife could divorce her husband. So the New Testament has several views on marriage and divorce. 
But in our text, Mark includes the Roman version. The real question before us is then what constitutes appropriate grounds for divorce? Is it for any cause, as in Matthew? Jesus sees marriage for what it is. Jesus sees marriage as God's divine intention for the human race. And what God has joined together, he quoted from the scriptures, let no one separate. But are there allowances? Are there occasions when marriage is really not functional, working, couple filled with love for each other? Is it possible that there could be abuse? Yes. There could be destructive tendencies in marriage by words or actions that make it too painful for, for a couple to tolerate their situation is not healthy. One commentator shrewdly suggested that Jesus could have said these words, what humans wrongly join together, let God rightly separate. For a woman of the first century, for example, to be left alone after her husband divorced her would make her not only a victim, but terribly vulnerable. Where would she go? What would she do? What about the children of her family in those days? And that is why these two themes, I think, fit together today, the question of divorce and the blessing of the children. Because that's what these two themes do. These children, too, were vulnerable little kids in that first century. They were often victimized by other adults. And like wives who had no bargaining power at a time of divorce, these kids did have, they had no social status and very few rights. So Jesus sees them as I think Pope Francis saw children in his wonderful six days here in America when he would stop his popemobile and reach out to the children that were in mother's arms along the route. He loved to bless them as he did, and he was gravitated, he gravitated to the children. Well, I think Jesus does, did too, because we have several passages about children in the Gospels, don't we? He took the children up in his arms. I like that phrase, he took them in his arms. He laid his hands on them, and he blesses them. He affirms them as he blesses them, let, letting them know by his actions that they are special, that they are precious, that they are worthy. And I believe God does the same things for us because he announces to us or declares to us, you and I are worthy of his love and blessing. We are worthy because of Christ, not because of our own good moral deeds, but because of Christ, because of his death on the cross and because of his resurrection. He has redeemed us, atoned for our sins, and has made us new people in his kingdom. Jesus shows us how precious children are. And he says to us, unless you welcome a little child like this, you cannot enter the kingdom of God. So the children become a symbol for entering into the kingdom. And he says, let them come, for it is such as these that the kingdom belongs. And welcome, whoever does not receive the kingdom will never enter it. Welcome the kingdom like you would welcome the child, with open arms and receptive hearts. In the first century, people could welcome someone with high status, but children were of low status, often seen as weak and unimportant in that day. Jesus lifts them up and tells his listeners and his disciples, if you want to enter the kingdom, you want to become like a child. So when all is said and done with these questions, what we believe then is that God, whose love is unconditional for this world, desires us to have healthy, strong marriages. Some years ago, you remember that there were marriage programs in the church. And I don't hear about it much now. I'm a little bit out of the loop, but I don't hear these, about these programs. And they were called, I believe, Marriage Encounter. And for some, they were called marriage enrichment. 
And so I called this good friend of ours. He stopped and did FaceTime with us while he was in Costco yesterday. And so we talked back and forth with each other and I said, what are those programs again that enriched marriage? And he said, marriage encounter. And I said, oh yes, I do remember that. Well, he said, we have been a part of marriage encounter since probably its beginning. And I said, well, are you still a part of it? He said, yes, it's been 30 years. And we still meet once a month with the people that we first met in these programs. They enhance marriage, these programs. They strengthen the time couples have with each other. And the relationships become more and more precious as the years go on. They're a gift for the church, those programs were. And I would hope that, I believe there was a pastor here in Janesville, in fact, years ago, that led marriage encounter workshops, maybe around the Midwest, I'm not sure how far. Well, I think the bottom line, among other things, is that while divorce needs to be lifted up, talked about, and uh, preached about, we also need to preach about the meaning and the gift that marriage is in our lives. So when a divorce or a separation comes, the church needs to be, as Pope Francis recently announced, that um, couples who have had divorces in their marriage or who have annulments in their marriage are still welcome back to the church. And it's unfortunate that in some cases the Catholic Church has refused to give them communion. But Pope Francis gives, has given a sense that now there's an openness to those folks who have gone through the agony of divorce. So the church needs to be there for all of us. It needs to be there to show compassion, to bring healing, to help people work through their pain and their hurt and the damages that may have been caused by the separation. So we ask that God will bless all marriages, that God will bless our homes and our children and our grandchildren and all our loved ones. And we pray that God will bless you, you people at St. John's who are faithful here at this congregation, as you live out your faith and as you show your love for one another. Amen. Our hymn following the message is 641, All Are Welcome.
Jesus in time and space share in Christ the feast that frees us all are welcome all are welcome in this place us God's people through our baptism into Christ, living together in trust and hope, let us now confess our faith. I believe in God the Father Almighty, creator of heaven and earth. I believe in Jesus Christ, God's only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried. He descended to the dead. On the third day he rose again, he ascended into heaven, he is seated at the right hand of the Father, and he will come to touch the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, in the Holy Catholic Church, communion, <coughs> forgiveness of sins, resurrection of the body, and the life of God. Made alive with Christ, with God in Christ, we pray now for the church, for those in need, and for all of God's creation. Holy and loving God, through the cross of Christ, continue your redeeming and unifying work among your people. Show us how to live well with each other as one family. Lord, in your mercy. Strengthen the bonds between humans and the animals who work with them on farms and households and in emergency situations. Teach us to value all animals, Lord, in your mercy. Walk faithfully with those who find great joy in relationships and with those who experience the pain of broken relationships. Make the church a place where all people may come to know loving companionship, Lord, in your mercy. Lift up your children who are bent and broken in times of crisis or long periods of suffering, especially those who we name in our hearts today, and those who've experienced loss and pain. By your presence, restore their hope and grant them mercy. Lord, in your mercy. Go out, guide and direct sisters and brothers in Christ who are engaged in specialized ministries for the sake of the world. Lord, in your mercy. We bless you for the lives of the saints, especially St. Francis of Assisi and Theodore, whom we commemorate today, through whom you have revealed your love for the world. Continue to reveal your covenant life through us until the last day. Lord, in your mercy. Gather these concerns and all who are in need into your abundant care, O God, remembering your promise of mercy through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. The peace of Christ be with you always. And also with you.
Please take a time to greet each other with the words of peace.
please stand as you're able. Let us pray. God of mercy and grace, the eyes of all wait upon you and you open your hand in blessing. Fill us with good things at your table, that we may come to the help of all in need through Jesus Christ, our Redeemer and Lord. Amen. The Lord be with you. And also with you. Lift up your hearts. We lift them to the Lord. Let us give thanks to the Lord our God. It is indeed right, our duty and our joy, that we should at all times and in all places give thanks and praise to you, almighty and merciful God, through our Savior, Jesus Christ, who on this day overcame death and the grave, by his glorious resurrection opened to us the way of everlasting life. So with all the choirs of angels and with the church on earth and the hosts of heaven, we praise your name and join their unending hymn. our table and our food, you created a world in which all might be satisfied by your abundance. You dined with Abraham and Sarah, promising them life. You fed your people Israel with manna from heaven. You sent your son to eat with sinners and to become food for the world. In the night in which he was betrayed, our Lord Jesus took bread and gave thanks, broke it and gave it to his disciples and said, take and eat. This is my body given for you. Do this for the remembrance of me. Again, after supper, he took the cup. He took the cup and gave thanks and gave it for all to drink, saying, This cup is the new covenant in my blood, shed for you and for all people for the forgiveness of sin. Do this as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. Remembering, therefore, his life given for us and his rising from the grave, we await his coming again to share with us the everlasting feast. By your spirit, nurture and sustain us with this meal. Strengthen us to serve all in hunger and want. And by this bread and cup, make us the body of your Son. Through him, all glory and honor is yours, Almighty Father, with the Holy Spirit in your holy church, both now and forever. Amen. Lord, remember us in your kingdom and teach us to pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not to temptation, but deliver us from evil. For I is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory, forever and ever. Amen. Jesus said, whoever comes to me will never be hungry, and whoever believes in me will never be thirsty. Thanks be to God. May be seated. for you, the body of Christ given for you, it's the body of Christ for you, Amen. it's the body of Christ given for you, it's the body of Christ for you. To get the blood of Christ shed for you, the blood of Christ shed for you, the blood of Christ shed for you. Shed for you, the blood of Christ shed for you. Of the world, see on us. And of God, away the sea, the world. Peace, sweet. 
take the bread? Yep. Okay, which side do you want? Uh, you want that side? Okay. Hmm? I'm sorry. You have communion? Did I? No, I did not receive communion. Oh, man. Oh, man. Oh, man. Thank you.